That was some good worship, guys. That was excellent. Thank you very much for that. Weren't they good? Oh, God is so good. Well, this morning, first of all, I want to thank Pastor Dustin and Beth for having my family and all of you guys. Thank you for having myself and my family here with you today. We're truly blessed and honored to be with you, and I'm super excited about sharing with you today, but a tad bit nervous. Because it's been a little while since I've actually preached a message. I mean, the last time I preached a message was May 26, 2019. So it's been a little bit. And uh, it's also the first time I've had the opportunity to stand before and, and present a message with my new bride, Tamara, sitting here listening as well. So I might want to check that. I'm extremely nervous. So you'll have to bear with me today. It's, it's been a little while, but you know what? God is so good, and, and I truly believe in his word when he says that apart from him, we can do nothing. You know, and, and praying, coming here this morning, it's like, Lord, apart from you, I can do nothing. I know, Lord, that as, as pastors and leaders, when we prepare messages, they are nothing but motivational speeches unless your Holy Spirit comes and moves in us and through us. So Lord, this morning I pray your Holy Spirit would move through me. Lord, let your words be spoken and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, you you guys are a church in transition, and, and sometimes transition brings trials. Sometimes it brings some struggles. And, and this morning, I prepared a message called The Depths of Our Trials. The Depths of Our Trials, because all of us, in one way or another, We'll go through things in our lives that challenge the scriptures that we believe to be true. Amen? Anybody been there before? I mean, there's many transitions in life. Some are good. Some are a little more, shall we say, rough. And in the good times, we can proclaim these scriptures. We can share with those that are hurting. We can get all riled up and and we can stand on what we believe to be true. Amen? And I know I stood on the stage for five years in Penticton and, and other places that I've had the opportunity to preach and I've shared scriptures and I've encouraged those who were hurting and I've said, these are the scriptures we need to stand on these words. But then comes a time in our lives when calamity strikes and we come face to face with reconciling what has happened to the word that we believe to be true. It becomes what we see versus what we believe. And the battle begins, doesn't it? See, we love the scripture in John 10, 10, where Jesus says this, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Life and life abundantly. I love that scripture. But Jesus never promised that we wouldn't go through tough times. He told us in John 16, 33, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. That sucks, doesn't it? Well, let's be real here. Like we can be real with ourselves when we're talking about the word. Sometimes there's parts of our Bible that we'd like to take a black Sharpie and highlight them, right? This is like, that's one of them. Here on earth, you will have trials and many trials and sorrows. Not just a few, but many. Come on, Lord. Really? Because the first part of John 10.10 tells us this, that there is a thief, we have an enemy, and that thief's purpose is one thing, to steal and kill and destroy. You have an enemy, and he's trying to steal your peace, he's trying to kill your joy, and he's trying to destroy your hope in Christ. He's trying to destroy your destiny here on earth and what God has planned for you and the big things that he has planned for us. And the last seven years in my life and for my family, for the lack of a better term, has been a roller coaster and it's felt like a roller coaster from hell. Ask my girls. It's been crazy. And today I want to share a little bit of that journey that we've taken and how God, in his faithfulness, has brought deeper revelation and understanding regarding a couple of scriptures that we as Christians stand on 
and how I've started to learn something. I say started because I have not got this mastered one bit. And that thing is, is to count it all joy. Count it all joy. And I believe this message will relate to you as a church because you're going through transitions and changes and, and that, that come with a one pastoral family leaving and a new pastoral family coming into place. Um, we went through that in Penticton when we left Fort Road here and, and moved to Penticton and pastored there for five years. It's, it's a transition. Things change. We are creatures of habit and we do not like change, do we? Change is, is, we look at change as a bad thing, but change is a good thing sometimes. You know, not everything is going to go the way you think it should or the way you plan it. But trust me, God works in all things. How many of you here today know that the word never changes? The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that means that God's word does not change. So if God is unchanging, then what he meant when he spoke these words, he means today for us. But what does change? What changes is the depth of our understanding of what God has written. You know, you can read the Bible from cover to cover, and you can read it again, and you can read it again, and you can read it again, and every time you read it, God will show you more understanding of what he's written. We can never get to a place where we, we know everything that's in here. Never. I, I, I still open the word and I read a scripture. I'm like, oh, wow. The scripture hasn't changed, but the depth of my understanding has, and that's what we call revelation. It's a deepening of our understanding. So I want to look at a couple of these scriptures with you today and give you a bit of testimony and revelation. I started with this, that one of my least favorite portions of scripture, and that I would personally love to take a sharpie to it and write it out, and white it out, clear it out, highlight it that way, is James 1 verse 2. And in the New King James Version, it says it like this, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. So who here, when you fall into a trial or something goes wrong, you're just like, hallelujah, woo! Praise the Lord. My car broke down this morning on the way to work. Hallelujah. I'm going to be late. Yeah, me neither. Usually it's like, oh. And sometimes you're just, you just get a loss for it, right? But here the Lord says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The New Living says, when trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. What? I don't know about you, but sometimes I read scriptures in the word and I'm like, huh? Why? Why do I have to do this? When calamity struck for our family in May of 2019, there were so many things that challenged my beliefs. And I could share for hours of the things that we've had to press through and the things that God showed me. But two particular scriptures hit me really hard. Because there's scriptures that we, we've stood on that, that come to us in times of trouble as Christians that we stand on. And, and I just couldn't seem to reconcile these scriptures with our situation. God, how? God, why? God, what? And the first one of those is Romans 8.28. And many of you might be familiar with this scripture. It says this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Amen? I mean, we have these hanging on our walls. We go out and we buy plaques with these scriptures on our walls, don't we? We hang them up, we pace them around, and we say, like, God, we stand on that word. And the second one is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. It's embossed right on the front of my Bible. <laughs> and I tell you, you get them, you look at them, they're like, yeah. Woo! God is good. I'm excited. He's got good things planned for me. A future, a hope, no disaster. Right? 
yeah, wrong. <laughs> and I thought in my situation at that time, I was like, how could there be good in this, Lord? How is this a future and a hope? Isn't this disaster? And I, I'm sure I'm not alone having asked those questions of God or some form of that question to our Lord. But the funny thing is, this is what the Lord took me to. He says, do you really know the full context of those scriptures and what the situation was when I spoke them? What led up to me sharing this message with you? Uh, no, God, sorry. Should I go back and read a little more? Yeah, maybe you should. Okay. Because leading up to the passage in Jeremiah 29, 11, the Israelites were living life, having a dream. No. They weren't tiptoeing through the tulips. No. No. Sunshine and roses. No, they were in captivity to the Babylonians. They were separated. Some in one place, some in another. They found themselves in bondage. They found themselves under the rule of an authority that was completely ungodly. All sorts of pagan worship. And all of a sudden, they're thinking, how did we get here? They never thought they would be there. And then out comes a prophet named Hananiah. And he tells people of Israel, guys, don't worry. Two years, God's going to take us out of this bondage and it'll all be over. Don't worry. But then Jeremiah comes along and he says, ah, no. Then he proceeds to tell them, that they're going to be in Babylon in captivity for 70 years. Two years, 70 years. I'm thinking I'm going to go listen to Hananiah. Right? Who's with me? We're all going, ah, yeah, you're the false prophet, Jeremiah. I mean, they never thought it would be like this. I honestly never thought my life would go the way it has. And Tamara and I were talking the other night, and I'm like, I never thought I would be here at my age. I'm not telling you how old I am. <laughs> I never thought that my life would go this way. And quite honestly, I think of the Israelites now, and I go, man, they didn't even have Jeremiah 29, 11 at that time, did they? <laughs> here, we got it, and we're like, ah! Put ourselves in their shoes. They're in the midst of it. And Jeremiah's like, yeah, you're going to be here for 70 years. But I have that scripture today. And things are going to be for my good and a future and a hope, right? I, I might be alone when sometimes I go into the word and I'm looking for answers and I'm like, Lord, I hope this is true. Come on, we have those struggles. We, none of us have it all together. There is no perfect people here. None of us have everything together. We have our struggles, and, and sometimes we need to be real with one another. You know, as pastors, we need to be, be real with you and say, hey, look, I don't sometimes get it. Why? But unfortunately, if you were told that following Jesus would be sunshine and roses, dancing through the tulips, it's not true. We know what Jesus said, that we will have troubles. But he also said to rejoice because he has overcome the world. Amen? That's just a little sneak peek at where we're going here. So here we see, leading up to Jeremiah 29, 11, the Israelites are in bondage. They're in captivity. They got these overlords over top of them. And so how does this relate to Romans 8, 28? Well, just before that, in Romans 8, 17, the Apostle Paul gives us a little bit of a foreshadowing of why he's going to say all things work together for good. Because he says this, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Woo, that makes you just go, yeah, that's me. I'm a child of God. I'm a co-heir with Christ to all that God has. Amen. But, okay, Paul, shut up. No, Paul, this is where you need to stop writing. 
But if we are to share his glory, we also share his suffering. Another portion of scripture you want to highlight with a sharpie. That's rough. But hang on, guys. Don't be discouraged. And some of you may be sitting here like, I have no clue what you're talking about your story, Pastor. So I'll give you a little overview, a quick overview of our backstory. In 2013, God spoke to my wife at that time, Carolyn, and myself, that we'd be moving to Penticton to pastor a church. We'd been part of Fort Road Victory Church since 1998. I'd been in business with my dad and my brother as long as I was old enough to hold wrenches. <laughs> we had a family business going and we were going crazy and I had to sit down with my dad and my brother and say, hey guys, I'm leaving. We had to share with our family. Our family was super close. My wife's family and our family, we were super close. We're all close together and we had to go, hey guys, we're moving provinces. At one point, one of our family members even said to us, are you taking our grandchildren to another country? <laughs> uh, geography lesson. BC's in Canada. But what we could see was the spiritual opposition to what God was calling us to do. It was just crazy. Like things that were crazy happening. And so it was, it was huge. It was a huge move for us. Packing up our three kids and walking away from our family to head to BC to where we knew exactly this many people. Not a single person in Penticton that we know. I knew Pastor Trevor at the time. Pastor Trevor Hoffman was the pastor. I knew him like this much. And we just up and moved. We moved out there at the beginning of 2014 after taking over the church and then having travel back and forth for six months because our house here wasn't selling. And now you're going, God, was this the right thing? What are we doing? And then in 2016, three days before her 40th birthday, Carolyn was diagnosed with a second round of cancer. And yet this time they told us, well, it's a metastatic cancer. It's through her entire body. We found out because she was out playing with the kids and Michaela was running around and she was going to tag her on the butt. And as she tagged her on the butt, broke her arm. How does that happen? And then they took us into this little room and we knew when they take you into an examination room and there's no examination table, there's two chairs. The news usually isn't good. And they showed us the x-ray and there was no bone left in her upper arm. It was just a thin little piece so they had to put a rod in and all this stuff. And then they told us, uh, there's something more going on here. We need to look. And next thing you know, there was cancer through her entire body, through all of her bones. She had fractures throughout her whole body. She had fractures in her spine. She had fractures in her hip. Now here's how big God is. She was jogging and doing 30-minute hit kickboxing every single day with a fractured back, with fractures in her pelvis, with fractures in her chest and all over her body. That's how big our God is, amen? But they told us all they could do was manage her quality of life. And this was a complete shock to our souls. It hit like a ton of bricks. But our God is greater, amen? Our God is healer. Our God is able. And we kept through with that. No, Lord, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do whatever you call us to do. She went through several treatments and through different things and she fought the good fight. In fact, many times we'd come back here for a visit and friends and family would see us and most people didn't even know she was sick. For three years, many people had no idea what was going on. And in fact, she spent most of the time with so little pain, occasionally she would take an Advil because God is that good. It's a testimony of how he is, how good he is. Yet ultimately on May 31st of 2019, she went home to be with the Lord. She had a vision of heaven. She even told us she saw Jesus. And how do you argue with that? You need to come back to us. No, nah, I've seen Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus looks a lot better than this. <laughs> I mean, we, we have to know that, I mean, God knows. But it was huge. It was difficult. We'd been together since we were 18 years old. Just about 24 years. We were coming up on our 18th year of marriage. 
How could this happen, Lord? We were serving you, God. We were living for you. We picked up and we moved for you, God. It was a blind side. And, and I'll say this, though, just as a side note, until she took her last breath, not once did I ever believe she would not be healed. I, we stood on God's word. In fact, after she passed away, I went to the funeral home three times believing that she would rise from the dead because that's our God. And you know what? Even through my struggles and reconciling God's word, this is still one, those are scriptures I do not struggle with, that God is still healer. I still 100% believe that God is able to heal, but it's God's will, not mine. He knows. We don't have all the answers and we all struggle with it, but he's still God. So here I am feeling like the Israelites, wondering, God, where did you go? Why did this happen? What's going on? I thought you worked everything for good, for a future and a hope and not disaster. It kind of feels like disaster right now. But this is where God began to deepen my understanding. Told me to kind of look back before we see this. So here's the Israelites in Jeremiah. They're, they're under bondage. And Jeremiah, when he says this to them, starting in verse 4 of that very scripture. Because we stand on, chapter, on verse 11. Woo! But we, you know what? The word of God's not a buffet. You can't just line up at the pierogies. Although I'd love to. You got to stop at the green stuff. You know, Pastor Morris Watson used to always say, if it's green, it's gone bad. It must not be good for you. <laughs> but Jeremiah says this, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. I love how Jeremiah introduces God to his people. The Lord of heaven's armies. There is no army that is greater than the Lord of heaven's armies. Amen? The God of Israel. This is what he says to all the captives. So we need to say, okay, when we're going through a trial, when we're going through a tribulation, when we feel like the enemy is rolling over our lives, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says to you today. Verse 5, this is what he says as you go through changes and growing pains as a church. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away. Work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray for it. Pray to the Lord for it and its welfare because its welfare will determine your welfare. What? You want us to live here, Lord? You want us to, to, to be prepared to stay here, Lord? See, Jeremiah tells him, build houses. Plan to stay, plant and grow. But what he is saying is, plan to be there in the midst of your circumstances and become who God has called you to be in the midst of the trial. Multiply. Allow this trial to draw out what God has called you to be. Don't. He wants us to grow through our trials. In the midst of our trials. Too many times, and, and I believe... Honestly, as Christians, we probably do this more than the world does. We spend more time looking for a way out. We spend more time going into our Bible going, Lord, show me the word that shows me how to get out of this. What's the quickest and easiest way, Lord, for me to get away from this? Where is the promise that tells me I don't need to be here? <laughs> right? <laughs> Look at these guys, they're like, uh-huh. <laughs> Yep. Because <laughs> as pastors, we do that a lot. But God's saying, stop looking for a way out. Rely on me and become who I've called you to be in the midst of this. Multiply. Grow. 
Get your children, if you have kids, growing in this direction in the midst of the trial. See, Hananiah was standing before them presenting a way out, an easy way out. Two years, guys, it's going to be over soon. Don't worry about it. This is a key statement. Too often we spend more time looking for a way out of the circumstances than looking for who we can become in the circumstances. I have. I still do. Many times. But in this particular trial that we went through as a family, there was no way out. When we came to the realization that she's not coming back, she's not rising up from that, there's no way out. You can't just walk away from that. So why does God say don't worry about finding a way out? Just become who I've called you to be. Sometimes it's like, God, it's easy for you to say that you're God. But he goes on, and this is where we get that promise. In Jeremiah 29, 10, and 11, this is what the Lord says, you will be in Babylon for 70 years. Doesn't that sound like the scripture where Jesus says, in this life, you will have troubles. But, but then I will come and do for you all the good things. I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. See, God knows where the end of our trial is. We don't. See, we're looking for that end, we're looking for that end, and we take our eyes off of where we're walking right now. And sometimes when we're looking so hard for the end, we fall on our faces. Instead of going, okay, God, what do you have for me here? Okay, an opportunity to grow. An opportunity to become who you've called me to be. And he says, for I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. He knows the time to bring that good things to us. Because he knows the plans, he knows the future, and we have hope in him that doesn't disappoint despite what we see. Again in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The two things I got underlined, everything. All things, some translations say all things. That's the good, the bad, and the really ugly things. Doesn't mean God caused the really ugly things. God didn't give Carolyn cancer. We live in a fallen world. Unfortunately, we live in a fallen world where those things may or may not happen. But you know what? God took that and he began to work it together for good. Because we focus on good things, but we forget about the everything. And we need to remember that this says that those that are called according to his purpose, these are us, those of us who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord. It doesn't say those who have finished or those who have accomplished or those who have got it all figured out. It's us that are messed up and just trying to get along sometimes. I didn't have it all figured out. But God began to press into my heart last year that it was time to move forward. I knew I was a child of God. I knew these scriptures and I knew that moving forward was what Carolyn wanted. We had discussed it in 2011 when she was diagnosed with cancer the first time. And we discussed it again, except I never wanted to hear it. So like, yeah, she's like, you know, if something ever happens to me, pfft. not quiet. But now I had to hear it because she was gone. This is what I want for our girls. This is what I want for you. And little did I know that God had a plan. I was surprised God had a plan. There was somewhere out there who needed us, the broken, the struggling us, just as much as we believed we needed them. And just as I began to think, okay, Lord, I have not dated in 25 years. I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't want to be dating and meeting different people and all that jazz. I mean, I didn't like dating the first time around. But Lord, I, I'm going to step out. I'm going to do this. And cue the COVID shutdown. <laughs> a 
Okay, Lord. Guess that you don't want this. How's this going to work? But I ask you this today. What's impossible with God? Nothing. Pastor Paul from Fort Road asks me, he says, I want you to be part of the church call team to keep in touch with people during the shutdown. (laughs) No. No. Because every part of me was like, this may come as a little bit of a surprise, but I'm very shy and introverted. Standing up here, this is like, this is the hardest thing for me to do. Meeting new people is like, it's the scariest thing in the world for me. Yeah, God has a sense of humor. I'm standing there before Pastor Paul, and I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. And I'm like, my head's saying no. Why are you saying yes? But inside, I knew that I needed to get back in touch with the people of the church that I've been gone from for five years. I didn't know a lot of people there. Okay, I'll do this. Pastor Paul emails me the list of the people I'm to call. I start looking through the list. Oh, great, there's only one person on this list that I know. Thank you, Lord. Cue the anxiety. I even had to write out what I was going to say to people when I called them. Because it was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And as I'm looking through the list, I get to the bottom of this list and I'm like, why is there a single mom on my list? You all laugh, but it's scary. I'm like, no. Good thing she's at the very bottom of the list. I'll call that one last. And I called her, and I went to an answering machine, so I hung up. Like, I did the pastor thing to do. I hung up. Didn't leave a message. I said to myself, well, I'll call one more time later, and if she doesn't answer, well, um, I tell Pastor Paul I called. She answered later, and I was that teenager in high school. Hi. This is Pastor Noel from Fort Road Victory Church. And she's like, hi, Pastor Noel. I'm like, oh, great. She knows who I am, and I have no idea who she is. Oh. But you know what? God is good. And that call, I'd say, that call led to everything. No, that was really weird and awkward. I said, just checking in, see how you and your daughter are doing. She's like, oh, by the way, I have a son too. I'm like, huh. Thank you, Pastor Paul, for telling me that. But you know what? God is good. And and over time, we talked a few more times. We began texting and we began to develop a relationship. And it flourished into a love and it's flourished into a new family. And it's crazy. It's scary. How can we count it all joy? Because God says this. We can because... In James 1, 3 and 4, it says, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Because trials will produce things in us if we allow them to, instead of looking for the way out. Let the developing of our patience come to fruition, and we'll find ourselves complete and lacking nothing. I want to be there. I want that. I want to be complete and lacking nothing. So when the next trial comes, I'm like, yes, you, I'm good. See, we're learning and we're getting revelation on finding joy in our trials. I'm not there yet. I began to understand Romans 8, 28 and Jeremiah 29, 11. I understand that. I got a depth of revelation, but counting it all joy is still really hard. Jesus said we're going to have those trials. Paul said that we're going to share in Christ's suffering, so we might as well learn to find joy. And I believe that we can find joy by looking for God in the midst, growing in the midst instead of running around looking for a way out. God showed my girls and I that we needed Tamara and her kids and that they needed us. And together, my oldest daughter, Hannah, she said, Dad, we're sitting at the table one night. She says, Dad. I'm like, what? We're seven. You know, Pastor Dad goes, yeah. Dad, seven is God's number of completion. Oh, yeah. We're seven. 
And he showed me that night, he said, you're building a family out of broken pieces. Each broken in such a way that they fit together with a little bit of refining. Is it easy? Guys, is it easy? No. They're all like, mm -mm. it's a struggle. But God is using the brokenness in each one of us to root out things that are not Christ in each other. And he's using the brokenness in each of us to draw out who Christ has called each one of us to be. The brokenness in each of us and learning to help each other heal completes in us who God has called us to be. Let the trials produce patience and let that do its work so we may be complete. Building a family out of broken pieces, seven of us slowly becoming complete with Christ in the middle. Guess what? That's exactly what God is doing with his church. Look around this place. Everyone in here is a broken piece. We've got broken pieces and we've got little things that are on us that need to be rubbed off. Guess what? That person next to you or across the sanctuary from you that you don't know yet or you're like, oh, do I really have to go to church with them? They're there to rub that off. Yay! But this is exactly what God is doing with his church. He's building a family with broken pieces. And when he does this, he works all things together. All of our imperfections, all of our brokenness, all of our neediness, all of what we have to offer, he works it all together for good. To bring out more in me, more in Tamara, more in our kids, to give us greater understanding when it comes to building the kingdom of God. He has a call for us. And in the midst of the trial, he's saying, plant, grow, and become who I've called you to be. Multiply, don't stop. Are we there yet? No. We're still trying to figure out how to get all of us to church on time. I mean, how does it work when I'm leading worship on a Sunday morning and Tamara's got to get five kids ready to be at church on time? And we laugh, but there's some times where that can be stressful. Mom's out there of several kids, like, you're like, mm-hmm. Or going to soccer games and practices, going two different way, ways five times a week. It's chaos a lot of times. But it could be one of two things. It can be beautiful chaos or it can be just straight chaos depending on what we choose. I believe that it's the same thing for each one of you here in this church. You're here for a reason. God's got you here for a reason. We, it's for you individually in your lives as we move through this thing called a pandemic, as you move through the change of a season and leadership here in this church, don't stop. Don't look for easy way out. Plant yourself. Grow yourself. See what God has for you to become in the midst of all of this. Allow the brokenness in one another and the trial that you're going through together to help each of you become all who God has called you to be and to experience the good things he has for us. See, you can, you can stop and you can look for the easy way out, but you miss when God gets you to the end of that trial and he's got the good thing for you. One of my heroes in the faith is Smith Wigglesworth. He said this, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved by what I believe. Today more than ever, we need to be moved by what we believe. And in closing, if, if we put these three scriptures together in an order, that makes sense of what God is telling us throughout these chapters. And that's my takeaway for today is this. In the midst of the struggles, count it all joy. For God knows the plans and he works all things together for good. In him we find true hope that does not disappoint. Amen? Amen. In the midst of the struggles, count it all joy, for God knows the plans and he works all things together for good. In him we find true hope that does not disappoint. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you, Lord, for each and every person here. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know the trial that they are going through or whether they're in a, a season of, of amazing blessing, Lord. But we all know that there are times in our lives when we, we don't always go from mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop, that we travel through valleys to the next mountaintop. 
Lord, I pray today that your word would bring comfort knowing that even in the midst of that, you have a plan and a purpose. In the midst of that trial, you know our future. It is for good. That it isn't for complete disaster. So Lord, I thank you today that you give each and every one here strength to continue to move on, to be able to count it all joy when they look at their circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.